All right, kids, come on up. You already am up. I'm glad. We've got three boys, four boys, and one, two, one, two, th five boys, and one, two, three, four, girl, five girls, ten people? Wow! You want to grab your brother's chair? That'll work. That way you don't have to kneel down on the floor. He won't mind. He doesn't use it again until next th Wednesday night, so it's okay. Perfect. Mm. Meanwhile, you're just getting squished. Well, that's okay. You guys can just enjoy each other's company. Now, we are going to sing our Fruit of the Spirit song, and I want you to be listening for the different Fruit of the Spirit that we're singing about, because I want you to tell me at the end of the song, which one haven't we yet talked about? Okay, so think about it. The fruit of the Spirit is, say it with me, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Let's do it one more time. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All right, now let's sing the song and be thinking, which one haven't we talked about yet? Because this is the last week. We've been talking about fruit of the Spirit for the last nine weeks, and this is the last one that we haven't yet talked about. So let's sing the song, Mr. Craig. Wow, you guys did amazing. That's great. Which fruit have we not yet talked about? Self-control. Self-control. Mm, nope. Which one? The watermelon. The watermelon. No, we haven't talked about the watermelon. That's true. Audrey? No, we did peace. Matthew? Faith. faith? No, we did faith. 
This one's hard. Because you don't think about it like a fruit of the Spirit. We did goodness. We did love. We did joy. Yes? No, we did faithfulness. Audrey? I mean, uh, uh, Marie? It begins with a P. Not peace. That's okay. Patience. That's the one we haven't talked about yet. What does it mean to have patience, to be patient? What do you think, Mariah? If you're in a line? Ah. And you're kind of like, come on, hurry up. I want to get on the roller coaster. And you have to be patient. What do you think, Rova? When you have to go to the bathroom and somebody's already in there and you're like, come on! That's a good one. I, I was telling somebody earlier today, I'm the oldest of seven kids. I understand what it means to have to stand in line and wait for the bathroom. Yes, ma'am. That's a very good one. My, child, my, grand, my daughter, when her children were very little, she taught them if they want to talk to her and she's trying to talk to somebody else, they have to come up and put their hand on her. And then she puts her hand on their hand to let them know, I, I know you're here, but I'm going to continue my conversation with my friend. And you just be patient for a minute, and then we'll talk in just a second. What other things do you have to be patient for? Um, to climb a tree. To climb a tree. Okay. Yeah, and summer. What about, what, go ahead, Marie. You have to be patient to play in the snow. You have to be patient to, to what? Play in the snow. Play in the snow in the winter because. You have to be patient for summer. That's right. What about, what about Christmas morning? You have to be patient for it's so tough to be patient for. I know. What about getting a new puppy? I know. Why? What? <laughs> You got a new puppy? Yeah. How, how, when did you get your new puppy? You did? How long did you have to wait before you could get it and bring it to your house? Do you remember? Was it a long time? Because you... Eleanor, how long was it? I think it was a month. Like a month? Why do you have to wait so long for puppies? I, bring, Mr. Craig, bring up this picture. Yesterday, my daughter, who lives in Michigan, sent us this picture of this little puppy. This little puppy is two weeks old. And this little puppy, of all the puppies in the litter, that puppy is the only one that has its eyes already starting to open up. The rest of their eyes are still closed. Show the other picture. That's her face, his face. Isn't that a cute puppy? That puppy's only two weeks old. How long do you have to wait before you're allowed to take the puppy to live in your house? You, before you can take the puppy away from its mama? Do you know how long? Eight weeks. So they're going to have to wait six more weeks. Why do you have to wait eight weeks for a puppy? Huh? They need their mom. Why do they need their mom? Well, there's an idea. You could just take the mom with you. Wait, well, but what do you think? Why do you need to... to, to... Exactly. Puppies can't eat regular food when they're babies like that. They, the only thing they can do is they can drink milk. And when they drink the milk from their mamas, they actually get special things in the milk that help them to grow and to be healthy. I'm not, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. No, they have to have milk from their mom. Exactly. They have to have their mama's milk. In addition to that, what else do they have to learn or, or experience while they're being little puppies in with their mama? Well, you could, but then the, be, the, the puppy will not be as healthy as it would normally be. And like the other thing that happens is the mama teaches the puppy how to be a dog. The mama helps the puppy to learn how to be around other dogs because the puppy has other puppies with 
them and the mother teaches them all how to be puppies and how to grow up to be good healthy dogs and so if you take a puppy away from its mama too soon you could actually harm the puppy so it's not good for the puppy and it's not good for you later on because you have a dog that won't obey that is it won't be socialized it will be aggressive towards other other dogs it might be aggressive towards you or other people you have to let the puppy go through the eight weeks with its mama so it can learn how to be a good dog and it's hard to wait my daughter and my son-in-law they want that puppy so bad they love that puppy already they've only met the puppy yesterday and they're already like i love this puppy i want to take it home but they can't they have to wait because if they don't wait they're going to have problems with themselves for themselves as well as for the puppy the puppy may not be healthy so it's hard sometimes to have to wait but they have to be patient yes ma'am you know what I believe that it is an American Staffordshire is what I was told, which means it's going to be a big, huge dog when it gets big. But um, anyway, the reason I'm talking to you about patience, one of the things about patience being a fruit of the Spirit is God helps you to be patient. Like when, when uh, Mariah was talking about standing in line at the roller coaster, you want to go, come on, hurry up, get out of my way. And you want to push people out of the way. Get on the roller coaster. But that's not a nice way to live, right? That's not a nice thing to do. And that doesn't honor God. God wants us to be kind and gentle with people. And part of that is being patient. Yes, Mr. Adrian. Why don't we what? Why don't you just get on it while it's moving? Because then you could get hurt. That would be silly. So anyway, when you are struggling, right? When you don't want to be patient, when you want to hurry up, you just have to ask God, help me to be patient, God. Yes, miss. Uh, you did what? <laughs> That's being silly. Let's, listen, I want you to remember this. When it's hard to be patient, you can ask God to give you patience and he will. All you have to do is say, God, I'm having a hard time. Please help me to be patient. And the Holy Spirit will give you patience because it's a fruit of the Spirit. So let's pray, and then you guys get to go back to your class, okay? God, bless these kids. Please help them, Lord, to come to understand that you give them patience. You give it through the power of your Holy Spirit, and that they need to just trust you and understand also, God, that when they are being patient and kind, and gentle. They are actually honoring you by showing other people what it's like to be a Christian. Father, I praise you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you guys can go back to your class now, okay? Thank you so much for coming. I just put it in front of the pew right there. It's fine. That's fine. Thanks. Well, today, ladies and gentlemen, we are in Philippians chapter 3. So if you will turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Now, the, the one thing I want to say before I get started, I have spent, during my time of preparation this week, I have spent, uh, I've taken a lot of time reading the same words, Philippians chapter 3, in various translations of the Bible. It helps me to hear it with different words spoken so that I don't, get used to hearing the same words over and over and over again because sometimes you can just get to the point where you don't even listen while you're reading because you're hearing the same thing over and over and over again. And one of the, one of the translations that I, I have that I really, really, really enjoy is called the New Century Version, NCV. The New Century Version, for those of you who have never heard of it, it is a translation of the Bible that is written to be very easy to read. So if you struggle, like if you say, you know, during devotions, it's so hard for me because I get all caught up in the these and the thous or whatever. This, the, the way this word, this, this translation is, is, is sent, the sentences are set up. They are shorter. They don't use big, uh, crazy words. They use very easy to understand words. And so as I read through these 21 verses today, I want you to listen not only to the words, of course, but listen to how these words are formed because for me this one is very easy to understand 
It's very easy to, to grasp the meaning of what's going on. And I love, I love the way they say these things. So let's go to chapter 3 of Philippians, verses 1 through 21. Paul is writing and he says, My brothers and sisters, be full of joy in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it will help you to be more ready. Watch out for those who do evil, who are like dogs, who demand to cut the body. We are the ones who are truly circumcised. We worship God through his spirit, and our pride is in Christ Jesus. We do not put trust in ourselves or anything we can do, although I might be able to put trust in myself. I mean, if anyone thinks he has a reason to trust in himself, he should know that I have greater reason for trusting in myself. I was circumcised eight days after my birth. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew, and my parents were Hebrews. I had a strict view of the law, which is why I became a Pharisee. I was so enthusiastic, I tried to hurt the church. No one could find fault with the way I obeyed the law of Moses. Those things were important to me. But now, I think they're worth nothing because of Christ. Not only those things, but I think that all things are worth nothing compared with the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have lost all those things. And I now know that they are worthless trash. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a second. In that verse, verse 8, where the translators here put worthless trash, the actual Greek word that Paul used was poo-poo. You get the meaning. He's like, it's like excrement on the ground. That's how I perceive this. So when he says this, let's read verse 8 again. Not only those things, but I think that all things are worth nothing compared with the greatness of knowing Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have lost all those things. And now I know that they are worthless. This allows me to have Christ and to belong to him. Now I am right with God, not because I followed the law, but because I believed in Christ. God uses my faith to make me right with him. I want to know Christ and the power that raised him from the dead. I want to share in his sufferings and become like him in his death. Then I have hope that I myself will be raised from the dead. I do not mean that I'm already as God wants me to be. I, I have not yet reached that goal, but I continue trying to reach it and to make it mine. Christ wants me to do that, which is the reason he made me his. Brothers and sisters, I know that I have not yet reached that goal, but there is one thing I always do, forgetting the past, and straining toward what is ahead. I keep trying to reach the goal, to get the prize for which God called me through Christ to the life above. All of us who are spiritually mature should think this way too. And if there are, those, if there are things that you don't agree with, well, God will make them clear to you. But we should continue following the truth we already have. Brothers and sisters, all of you should try to follow my example and to copy those who live the way we showed you. Many people live like enemies of the cross of Christ. I have offer, often told you about them, and it makes me cry to tell you about them now. In the end, they will be destroyed. They do whatever their bodies want. They are proud of their shameful acts, and they think only about earthly things. But our homeland is in heaven, and we are waiting for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven by his power to rule all things. He will change our humble bodies and make them like his own glorious body. These last two verses 
Our homeland is heaven and we are waiting patiently for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven. By his power to rule all things, he will change our humble bodies and make them like his own glorious body. I don't want to focus on the patience so much, but I wanted to bring that out before I forgot it. One of the challenges of being a Christian is you don't get sucked up into heaven moments after you give your life to Christ. You have to still live on this earth. You have to still go through the normal day-to-day -day stuff. And it gets aggravating <laughs> at times. It's like knowing that on Christmas morning I get to open up that present. And it's something I know that I want. I've been promised that it is exactly what I asked for. But I cannot touch it. I cannot open it. I cannot even begin to experience or enjoy using it or having it in my life until Christmas morning. And it is January 21st. <sighs> And I got almost a whole year before I'm allowed to even go into that. I mean, do you, do you hear the angst, the frustration? So for someone who comes to faith early and then still has to live 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years on this earth, that is an aggravation. And at the same time, the enemy is always trying to, ag to hit you in that spot saying, do you really believe this? You really believe this? Come on. Come on. It's been 2,000 years. He's not coming back. Just go on and live your life. Do what you want to do. Now, again, that's not the, the gist of what I wanted to say, but I wanted to hit on that this morning because that is one of the things for me that the enemy has really, really been hitting me hard in the last year or so. I'm 65 years old. I've been a Christian since I was 15, uh, 16 years old. It's almost been 50 years. And it's like, is this real? Do you really believe this? And every time I pray, every time I have my morning devotions, I say the Apostles' Creed and I say the Nicene Creed. And I say in those prayers, I believe in the resurrection. I believe that I'm going to be with the Father. I believe. And there's times when the enemy's, even in my prayer time, whispering, really? Really? You really believe that? And the reason that, the reason that I'm talking about all of this is if you go back to what Paul says at the beginning of this, verse, of this chapter. He says, there are times that people get caught up in the, in the doing of their religion instead of the being of their religion. He said in verse 2, watch out for those who do evil. They're like dogs who demand to cut the body. And what he's saying there, what he's talking about, is if you remember, Paul's ministry was to people who were not Jewish. His ministry was to the, the Gentile world. Well, one of the distinguishing things about being Jewish in the physical realm is that on the eighth day of life, every male in the Jewish culture was circumcised, physically cut. And that was an, a physical and outward sign of their relationship with God and their community. And so when people were coming to <clears throat> faith in Christ, the people who had been Jews who came to faith in Christ said, well, you got to be Jewish to be a Christian because Jesus was Jewish, and that's what you do. And Paul's like, no, that's not what you do. And there was a big argument about it. And Paul, it says in the book of Acts chapter 15, Paul actually came down to uh, Jerusalem to talk with the leaders of the Christian church and said, 
what is the story here? What is the truth? What is, the, what is our theology regarding this? And the, the, it's called the Great Jerusalem Council. And the end result of the Jerusalem Council was, no, they do not have to become Jewish in order to be Christian. Therefore, they do not have to submit to physical circumcision in order to be Christians. But what Paul is saying in verse 2 of chapter 3 in Philippians is, there are still people out there who are preaching and teaching this mess. And they're coming into the churches in Asia and in, uh, in Macedonia and saying, you have to become Jewish before you can be a Christian. And it is messing everything up. And Paul is saying, I wish that you, need, you just need to watch out for these people. You need to be aware that they're there and don't listen to that because that matter has already been settled by the leaders of the church. That is not part of what we believe. You need to simply have faith in Christ. There is no physical demonstration of what you have to do to quote-unquote become a Christian. And then he says, as a matter of fact, you people who think it's all that in a bag of chips to be Christian, to be Jewish before you're a Christian, I'm going to tell you, I myself have every reason to put myself at the head of that line. Verse 4, if anyone thinks he has reason to trust in himself by what he has done, he should know that I have greater reason for trusting in myself. Number one, verse five, I was circumcised on the eighth day of my, after my birth. Number two, I am from the people of Israel, and I know the, tri the tribal lineage. I am from Benjamin. I am a Hebrew among Hebrews. My parents were Hebrews. We are pure. I had a very strict view of the law, which is why I became a Pharisee. I was so enthusiastic. Now, in most of your translations, it'll say I had so much zeal. I was so enthusiastic, I tried to hurt the fledgling Christian church. And we know his story from Acts. He literally went around arresting people and throwing them into prison and having them beaten for their faith in Christ. Paul says in verse 6, No one could find fault in the way I obeyed the law of Moses. But then verse 7, something changed. Those things were important to me. But now, I think they're worth nothing because of Christ. As I was reflecting on this, One of the thoughts that I, <coughs> excuse me, that I had was as we walk through our life, just our day-to-day -day life, not worrying about your theology, just your life, not all of you become pastors. There's only one in the room, two in the room, three in the room right now three people in this room that are in any way, shape, or form becoming a pastor or a minister in the Church of the Nazarene. So where does that leave the rest of you? Well, as I look around the room, some of you have accounting backgrounds. Some of you work with veterans. Some of you are nurses. Some of you are skilled in the, in the mechanical field. Some of you are skilled gardeners. Some of you are very intelligent and, and have great understanding when it comes to dogs. I was really hesitant to use dogs as an example this morning for fear that I would say something stupid to the children because I knew there's a lot of experts in this room about how to take care of puppies. There are some people in, the, there are people in this room who are experts in their fields. But that doesn't make you a good Christian. And even those of us, the three of us who are preparing for ministry or are already in active ministry, doing that doesn't make us a good Christian. That's simply walking out what God has laid before us and has asked of us. So what is it that makes you a good Christian? Because again, I said it is not a matter of doing, it is a matter of being. 
And Paul says it very clearly. If you follow on to verses 8, 9, 10, 11, it says, not only those things, but I think that all things are worth nothing compared with the greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Because of him, I have lost all those things. And now I know they are worthless trash. This allows me to have Christ and to belong to him. Now I am right with God. Not because I followed the law, I did, but because I believed in Christ. God uses my faith to make me right with him. Coming into right relationship with God is not a matter of doing. It is a matter of being or believing. It is simply saying, I will not place my trust in anything other than the truth that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's it. You can be an expert dog handler. You can be an expert gardener. You can be the most efficient and caring nurse. You can be the best uh, accountant. You can be the best minister and any other. I'm forgetting lots. But none of that matters as much as having a tiny little grain of faith that God is real, that God loves you, that God willingly gave his only son so that you could have eternal life. But the thing that is so cool about being in relationship with God, which is what Paul is talking about here, it's not simply a matter of having a belief system or, be or a faith. Yes, that's part of it. But Paul says in verse 10, I want to know Christ. What does that mean? I know about him. I've read the Bible. I know that Jesus came and was born on, uh, in Bethlehem and was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And I know that I, when he was a, an infant, they had to take him to Egypt to protect him from the, uh, the king that was trying to kill all the babies. And I know that when he was in 12 years old, he stayed in the temple for three days and his parents didn't know where he was. And I know all of the stories I know about Jesus. But when Paul says, I want to know Christ, what does that mean for you? See, it's more than just putting information into the brain. It's more than just going to church on a Sunday morning or going to a Bible study on Wednesday night. It is more than reading your Bible multiple times throughout the day or week. What does it mean to know Christ? I will not embarrass the person by calling attention to them, by calling them by name. But you may know who I'm talking about when I say we have a person who's part of our congregation who literally maintains almost a 24-7 conversation with God. You will, you will if, if they are not aware that you're, present, that you're present, they will be talking out loud to God. And then when they recognize you're there, they'll go, oh, and they'll walk to another space. Because that's how they know God. They acknowledge that God is present with them all the time, 24-7. And they are in communication with God all the time, 24-7. And quite honestly, I would much rather live that way than open up my Bible and go, oh, it's been like three weeks since I read this, since I started, last time I read the Bible. Oh, my word. 
I would much rather be so much in love with God and so much in touch with God than barely touching him and barely reading his word and barely coming to church. Now, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. Please. I'm just showing you extremes. So on this extreme, this continuum of I am in constant communion with God moment by moment, every waking moment of the day, and even in my dreams, or uh, every once in a while I open up the word, every once in a while I come to church, every once in a while I, I give God acknowledgement in my life. Where on that continuum are you in your knowing God? Again, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I don't care to know where you place yourself on that list. That's between you and God. But if you want to be Christ-like, if you want to be a quote-unquote good Christian, you should hopefully find yourself more on this side of the continuum than on this side of the continuum with this idea of knowing Christ. In addition to that, Paul says, not only do I want to know God intimately, but I want to know the power that raised him from the dead. How can you know that? I'll share just a simple little story. You heard a testimony today already of somebody who the family was looking for a new vehicle. And they truly felt like God pointed them, specifically pointed them to the dealership that they needed to go to through various signs that happened in their life over the course of a day or so. And it has come back now that they've made the purchase that they feel 100% confident that it indeed was God's purpose and plan for them to get this exact vehicle from that exact place and they can give glory to God through all of it. And for me, that is knowing the power that raised Christ from the dead. Because I can know that the same God who raised Christ from the dead can work in my life. He can give me discernment. He can give me wisdom. He can give me patience. He can give me uh, abilities beyond my own strength and, and understanding. <coughs> I can recognize, well, use the example of Peter walking on water. Peter didn't have it in himself to walk on water. He said, if it's really you, Lord, call me to come out to you. And Jesus said, okay, come on out. He went, oh, okay. And he stepped out of the boat. The other 11 sat down on their bottoms in the boat. They should have all gotten out of the boat. But their power wasn't Peter's. The power was Christ's, imparted to Peter to enable Peter to literally circumvent all the, the, the law of gravity. He should have sunk, but he didn't. I'll say laws of physics, because I don't know all the physics involved. It might not have been just gravity. But that's knowing the power of God. Paul then says, not only do I want to know Christ, I want to have an intimate relationship with him. Not only do I want to have power in my life from God, I want to share in his suffering. Uh, maybe not. I, 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 I remember many years ago when I was a, a, a brand spanking new Christian. This is back in the day when there were Christian coffee houses, for those of you who are old enough to understand and know what I'm talking about. And you would go into the Christian coffee house and there would be somebody on the guitar and a little stool up on this little platform and everyone else is sitting there drinking coffee and being holy and pious. And Anyway, there was this one time I was at this Christian coffee house and this young woman got up and did a little skit. And her skit was all about the cross. And I can't do it justice, I can just give you the gist of it. Basically it was like, Lord, that, that cross is awful rough and it's scratchy and it, I, it gives me splinters and God, there's blood on it. I mean, that's disgusting. 
can't we just have a nice little gold one that's shiny and pretty that I could put on my neck? God? God? Hello? And you see, she was trying to um, convince God that she could be in relationship with God on her own terms instead of being willing to accept whatever God brought before her. There, and again, I'm not, I'm not making disparaging comments about any other church, any other pastor, any other religion. Just understand, I don't believe that I can specifically say, well, because I believe it, I'm going to get it. Therefore, I should have a brand new car, and I should have a brand new house, and I should have a million dollars in the bank, and I should have, and I should have. Because there is no promise that I can see in scriptures that doesn't say we will not have hard times. What I hear in scripture is that God says, when hard times come, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You can walk in my strength. When you are tempted, I will guarantee you that you are not tempted beyond that which you can bear, and I will always promise you that there will be a way out. You have to be watching for it, and you have to take that step to get out. But I promise you there will always be that. And so there is not this thing of being a bed of roses when it comes to being a Christian, but there is walking a normal daily life, and you will have issues, and you will have things. I have a nephew, a great nephew that we just talked about, uh, that Renee just shared. He has this really weird and crazy injury from a football injury where literally, I don't want to get into all the details because I don't know what the family wants shared or not shared, but if they were to just run in there and do the surgery right now, there's a possibility this 17-year-old kid could die. It's that bad. So the doctors are taking a very careful and, and meth methodical step-by-step step, planning out everything and assembling all the specialists so that they can make sure that they do the right thing at the right time and that they're prepared for any contingency that might come up. Now, this kid loves the Lord. His parents love the Lord. His, his grandparents love the Lord and their great-grandparents love the Lord and all of us are Christians and not many of us are ministers. And have served the Lord for years and years and years and years and years and years. Why in the world does this have to happen to this kid? He's in the very, very early part of his life. He has the potential for being a great musical star in the country and western world. This kid has gifts and talents and abilities. He is amazing in his sports ability and in his singing and in his music and his giftedness and his love for the Lord. And it's literally to the point like, oh my word, this could have killed him. God, how can you allow these bad things to happen to your children? It's not that God wants bad things to happen, but God does allow bad things, and God can bring good out of it. The promise we have is that God doesn't keep the bad from happening, but God can bring good out of it. God can strengthen you. So when Paul says, I want to share in his sufferings, that's a hard one for me to own, quite frankly. I don't want suffering in my life. But if I can share in suffering for God, yeah. Let me give you a lighter one. My wife and I desperately loved Renee's parents. I, they, were, they were mom and dad to me. They weren't in-laws. They were mom and dad to me. And I spent 21 years in the military and we, would, we were able to come home and visit and see them, you know, once every couple of years. One time they were able to come over to England and visit with us. But we were never able to be in the same room at the same time, in the same town at the same time, most of our lives. And then it came time for me to retire from the military. And God said, go to Bible college. I want you to be a pastor, and it's time for you to go to Bible college. And I had committed to doing that. And we were in the process of selling our home and moving up to Colorado from Texas. And totally unforeseen, Renee's dad and mom retire from the job, the ministry that they've been part of for the last 14 plus years. And they move back to the town that we had been living in. And to add insult to injury, the house that they moved into was a block and a half from the house that we were selling. 
God? And now I'm finding out that I could have gone online for classes and not moved from Texas to Colorado? You didn't let me know that that was a possibility until after I had already committed all of this. And now they're moving two blocks away? I will do this, God, because I know this is your will. This is not fun. This is not what I would have chosen. And we had to leave. And we spent five years in Bible college, and we went back every few months to see and visit. And then we get called to Alaska. And my mother-in-law and father-in-law were like, well, we could come up and see you. And within three years, they're dead. So for me, as minor as that may sound to some, for me, that's sharing in God's, in the sufferings of Christ. Because I'm willing to do what God asked me to do, even though it's costing me a great deal even though it's hurting me a great deal, even though what I want is not happening, I'm willing to do this because I love you, God, and I want to serve you, God. And then the last part of verse 10, I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of Christ. I want to be sharing in his sufferings and then Paul says, I want to become like him in his death. Sounds horrible. But if you think about it, once Jesus died, he got to go be with the Father. Once Jesus died, everything was put back to right. The full plan of God was brought to what it should have been from the beginning. The relationships with God is possible now because of the death and resurrection of Christ. Christ is literally seated at the right hand of the Father speaking to the Father on our behalf. There's going to come a time when Christ will return, his foes will be defeated, and we will enter into whatever eternity is. So this idea of becoming like him in his death, it's not laying dead on a cross or laying dead in a tomb, but it's being alive after death. For me, that's what I see here. So not only do I get to have a relationship with God here and experience his power and also have to do some suffering for him, but I get the promise of being with and like him after my, my own physical death. Verse 11, I have hope that I myself will be raised from the dead. Then verse 13, and we're almost done, but verse 13 says, I know that I haven't reached that goal yet, but there is one thing I always do. Forgetting the past, straining towards what is ahead, I keep trying to reach the goal to get the prize for which God has called me through Christ to the life above. But again, it is not a doing. It is a being. It is having faith. It is trusting. It is putting all of your hope in God. And again, I want to I go back to this patience that we talked about at the very beginning. Paul says in verse 20, Our homeland is in heaven. 
and we are waiting for our Savior to come from heaven and by his power to rule all things. He will change us. He will change our humble bodies and he will make us like his own glorious body. But until that day comes, we need to be faithful. We need to keep our eyes focused on him, not allowing the enemy to distract us, to dissuade us, or to discourage us. But to press on. And again, press on has this, I, I hesitated to even use that. I almost, I was, I was trying to think of how to name my sermon and I almost said press on, but I don't want it to be press on because that has this idea that I'm doing something. The whole thing is I am looking forward in hope and in trust and in faith that God has it. And that God is going to see it all come to fruition in my life and in the lives of the people I love. It is a matter of faith. It is not a matter of doing. And I would encourage you this week, as we go back to this idea of this continuum, where are you on that continuum? Are you totally with God? Or do you give God lip service? Or are you somewhere in between? And I, I would encourage you this week to be intentional. Get on your face before God. Not with me, not with your spouse, not with your family. Just you and God. And say, God, I want to be as close to you as I possibly can. I want to be right there with you. I want to feel your power, your presence, your love, your grace, your mercy. I want to be aware of you. I want to know you. Help me, God. Help me. Lord, bless us now as we get ready to go to this time of communion, this time of celebration of thanksgiving for what you've done for us. Bless us, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.